This specific post is the true account of a scary incident I was unwillingly made a part of when I was a younger man. It's also the story of how a lifelong friendship can be destroyed because of a stupid decision. This whole story started about 10 years ago when I was a senior in high school. As a freshman, my best friend and I had made a plan to take a road trip across the country to Vegas, where we would gamble and celebrate our graduation from school. Despite several close calls with my math classes, I still managed to get the credits I needed to graduate with my class. It was something that I must admit I wasn't sure was going to happen. When it came to Glenn, my best friend since I was four and the other guy involved in the scheme, there was never any doubt he'd make it through with the rest of us. He ended up graduating second in our class, after all. Even though the plan had been in the works for four years, we had yet to okay the trip with our parents. We also had the logistical problem of neither one of us owning a car we felt could be trusted on a trip that long. Then, like a gift from the gods, my parents gave me a brand new convertible Mustang for a graduation present. The day my parents surprised me with the car, my dad happened to ask me what I had planned for the summer. Since we had yet to unveil our plan upon our folks, I saw this as the best opportunity to drop it on mine. After I laid out the whole deal to my dad, he stood silently for a moment with a look of deep concentration on his face. Then, after what seemed like an eternity, he said, Well, you two are about to go off to two different colleges and won't get to see each other for at least four years. I don't see why you can't have two weeks to celebrate and blow off some steam. Have a good time, but be careful. I was so excited I could barely say thank you, but I pulled it off in the end. When I called Glenn to give him the good news, he told me his mother had already okayed him to go on the trip. This really wasn't much of a shock considering his mom had given him anything he wanted since his dad had left them five years before. She gave him $500 that she called a graduation present, but we knew that she knew that he didn't have a dime to take on that trip with him. He was well aware that the moment he told her about the trip, she would give him money. But he let her continue on with her graduation present ruse to make her feel better about it. The Monday after the commencement ceremony, we packed up the car and headed out. Although we had two full weeks to enjoy ourselves, we wanted to get to Las Vegas as fast as possible. We had invested in a radar detector so we could be less likely to get pulled over for speeding, and believe me, we were speeding. Averaging around 100 miles per hour and shortest we got across the state in record time, and this was our plan for the entire drive back and forth. We managed to make it to Las Vegas in less than 7 hours, but we were so tired when we got there we decided to crash out, so we'd be fresh when we hit the casino. After 8 or 9 hours of sleep, we hit the town. I'm not sure how long we managed to stay up for, but at the end of a week-long binge of girls and gambling, I felt as if I had been awake for a year. By the end of that week, we'd lost anything we had managed to win five times over, and we were dead broke. I may have lost every cent I'd saved for the past four years, but I'm confident I'll never have more fun in my life than I did that week in Vegas. Unfortunately, Glenn managed to ruin all that fun with one dumb action, an action that would destroy our friendship forever. We had just about enough money left to pay for gas back, so the morning after a 10-hour rest, we loaded the car and made for home. I was sure I need at least a week just to recuperate from the trip, so I was in a hurry to get back to Albuquerque. Halfway home, we came across a guy hitchhiking. Obviously... If I had been driving, I wouldn't have stopped, but Glenn thought he was going to be funny and he pulled over to let the guy in, or so I thought. He pulled the car over despite my many protests. The hitchhiker began jogging toward the car. When he got about a foot from the back of the car, Glenn slammed on the gas and took off, blasting the guy with rocks and dirt. He'd done some sorry things to people before, but this was beyond funny, as far as I was concerned, and... If it would have ended there, we'd probably still be friends today, but it didn't. Less than a mile down the road, we realized the car was running on fumes, so Glenn pulled into a gas station not far ahead. While he pumped the gas, I went in and paid, and while I was there, picked up some snacks and drinks. 
On my way out, I happened to notice someone running down the side of the road. He wasn't that far away when I realized it was the same hitchhiker Glenn had just sprayed with rocks. He was still around 50 yards away from the parking lot when I pointed him out to Glenn. Apparently, not caring if we had an encounter with a guy or not, Glenn continued to watch as he drew closer in the rearview mirror. He finally put the car in drive and began slowly pulling out of the gas station lot. I wasn't sure why he was driving so slow, so I yelled at him to go ahead and stop taunting the guy. He was acting as if though he wanted the guy to reach us so he could continue to mess with him. The hitchhiker could obviously see us. I could hear him yelling in the direction of the car. When Glenn had circled the car around the pumps and was pulling from the lot, the hitchhiker was within spitting distance from us. Now I could hear what he was saying, and he was definitely angry. Hearing this only proved to make Glenn laugh, but the look on his face quickly changed to one of terror when he noticed the hitchhiker pulled a gun from the back of his pants and aimed it at us. I only heard, you sorry mother, before he started firing. The gunshots finally got Glenn to press the gas. We were out of sight of the gas station in a matter of seconds. To say I was mad would be an understatement. Not only had he got my car shot up, but we also ended up the same way. All just because Glenn thought it would be funny to antagonize a complete stranger. We made it home a few hours after that, and I didn't talk to Glenn the whole remainder of the drive. When I dropped him off at his place, he attempted to make a joke out of the whole experience, but I wasn't laughing. The incident had showed me how cruel he could be, and I didn't want to have anything to do with anyone like that, no matter how long we'd known one another. Once I'd make it back home and explain to my dad what had happened, he was mad, but he understood why I wanted to deal with the repairs myself and not get Glenn involved in any aspect of my life from that day forward. The repairs we handled and a few months later I went off to school. Glenn did make a few attempts to patch things up with me, but each time he called I let it go to voicemail. I never bothered to call him back and we still haven't spoken all these years later. If there was anything I took away from this part of my life, I learned that people may never tell you the type of person they truly are, but they almost always will show their true face if you pay attention. It probably sounds petty that I would end such a long friendship over something so small, but that incident showed me that even after all the years of being friends, he had no respect for me or others for that matter. If he couldn't say sorry after all the carnage that he had created... I couldn't respect him. It's one of those things that has always been important to me and should be the basis of a good friendship. My hope is that he learned from this and has become a better man, but when it comes to people, one thing I discovered is that they rarely change. My mom always told me that I was a restless soul. And if my life has shown me anything, she had me pegged. Since my 20th year of life, I've moved at least 10 times, and that's a conservative estimate. Ever since I can remember, I was foaming at the mouth to move away from my hometown. Things just got worse as I grew into my teens. Being exposed through television and movies to the bigger world outside made staying in my little world suffocating, and that was before the internet. I can only imagine the misery for a teenager stuck in a small town in America brimming over with hopes and dreams in this small world of the World Wide Web. The story I'm going to share with you occurred during one of those 10 plus moves and once you hear it I'm sure you'll understand why it stuck with me all of these years later. I've been living in the capital for over two years and although I love my life here, this was 1994 and Despite the fact that jobs were on the rise because of the upcoming tech boom, the price of living and low number of places to live made finding a new place to live almost impossible. My current roommates had made the wise decision to kick me out. At the time, my drinking was out of control and I did something that they couldn't look past, so I had no other option than to move back to my hometown. It was the last thing I ever wanted to do, but I wasn't made to live on the streets. When I got back to town, I would be living with my parents in their house, which made it even more humiliating. 
My ego had to take a back seat to the safety of having a roof over my head, so I rented a U-Haul and loaded up my few belongings and waved goodbye to my new home. The drive would take about four and a half hours and I was in no hurry to get where I was going, so I took my time and kept to the speed limit. I stopped at a few places as I left town to say goodbye to a few people that I'd managed to befriend in the time that I was there. My only hope was that someday, before I got too old, that I'd get back there at least one more time, at least a visit. The last stop was for one final goodbye to my girlfriend. We decided to not try the whole long distance romance thing. It wouldn't be fair enough to either of us considering I didn't know if I'd ever see her again. After three hours at her place, I finally pulled myself away and hit the highway. The majority of the journey for the next few hours was agonizingly boring, and the few times I felt myself losing my grip on the road, I'd stop and take a break. Even if it was just for a couple of minutes, I got back on the road refreshed. Later that day, I did spend the good part of an hour stuck in a traffic jam. Me dragging meant that I had not been paying close enough attention to the time and I ended up catching the after work rush hour. Even though I'd spent the past few years in a big city, i have been taking public transportation. i have been out of touch with the daily commuter's grind just long enough to forget when it started and ended, but I guess it wasn't that bad. It broke up the monotony of the drive and kept my mind engaged. The slow-moving party of cars eventually began breaking up little by little until I was able to get back up to the speed limit again and move away from the few remaining cars still bunched together. It still amazes me when most drivers are given the chance to break free from a mass of cars that they chose to stay bunched together like a group of sheep. I've always loved being the only car for miles with no one around me. This also has prevented me from wrecking into another car, so it seems to work for me so far. I see no reason to change it. Once I'd gotten away from the traffic jam, I was about 45 minutes away from my destination. The few cars I'd passed stayed to the right to let me go by them. This was until I came up upon a small group of three box trucks, not much larger than the U-Haul I was driving. Because of their sizes, I was unable to see what was slowing them down, but I assumed it had to be coming from a vehicle in front of them. We were all spread out roughly 30 yards apart from each other in the right lane, but I was closing fast and knew I needed to slow down, so I did. At this point, we'd gotten within three cars lengths from one another and, out of nowhere, the leader slammed on his brakes. The truck in front of me and myself had to make a quick decision. When a fully loaded box truck is doing 45 miles an hour and someone stops in front of him, he is mere seconds to make a choice or everyone will end up dead. Now, I'd always been taught, or maybe I just decided one day, that it's safer to pass a car on the outside if the road has a paved shoulder. I don't know if this is actually the proper way to avoid a wreck, but this day, it proved to be the right one. The guy driving the truck in front of me chose to pass on the left, and on any other day, this would have been fine. There weren't any other cars in the left lane, but there was a man. As I came around the front of the stop truck, I saw what I think was the reason he stopped so quickly. When I passed, I looked back to see some type of Japanese motorcycle laid over in the middle of the road and the driver crawling on his side for the left-hand shoulder. Unfortunately for him, he didn't make it. I wouldn't have time to comprehend what I was seeing before I witnessed the horror that stuck with me all of these years. Just as I'd taken in the scene... The truck that had been in front of me mere moments before blew past the stopped one, running the crawling rider over in the process. The air was yanked from my lungs instantly and my jaw dropped into my lap. Everything had happened so fast it wasn't until I began hyperventilating that I fully grasped what had just happened. I continued on the shoulder for another half mile or so trying to determine if I should go back, but it was obvious that after what I had seen... I wouldn't be of any help to anyone. I took one more look in my rearview mirror to see the carnage. The two trucks sat still in the middle of the highway and no people were moving. Saying a short prayer for all the poor men involved, I pulled onto the road and headed for my hometown, begging to God to remove that awful image from my mind the whole way there. When I finally pulled up to my parents' house, I was strangely happy to see it. I didn't tell them what had happened. They were over the moon to see me again and 
Reliving it so soon was the last thing I wanted to do. We moved forward 25 years to today and this is the first time I've told anyone other than my wife about that day. Although I've done my best to put it behind me, it still holds a prominent place in my subconscious mind. It shows up in my dreams from time to time, sometimes drastically different from how it happened but usually as clear as the second I saw it. I've beat myself up occasionally now that I've grown up for not stopping to help, but if I'm honest with myself, I was still a kid and I wasn't mature enough to handle a situation like that yet. After all, what do you say to a guy that's just ran over another guy at 40 plus miles an hour? Sorry dude, just doesn't cut it. I'd like to preface this story by saying that in my youth I was not a good person. People's opinions had a strong effect on me. The neighborhood I grew up in was riddled with crime. As a result, most of those surrounding me were criminals. Seeing the smooth cars they drove and clothes they wore made me believe breaking the law was a cool way to move up in the world. Most of my friends thought the same way. When they got involved in some bit of villainy, I was right behind them. Not joining in their crimes didn't seem to be a choice. The few times my gut told me their schemes were a bad idea, their questioning of my manhood put me back in line. They knew how to push my buttons and exploit my low sense of confidence. Growing up without a father can often do that to a man, and it took me a long time to learn how to overcome it, but this story isn't about that. Throughout my younger life, I spent a large amount of time in some kind of jail or prison. It took a good 20 years to realize that path in life was a dead end. Don't get me wrong, I wasn't a violent offender. Most of us weren't. My meaning is only to say that that kind of life gets you nowhere and that was just where I was when I heard one of the sickest stories I've ever heard. On one of the many stints at a prison in Texas, I was moved from the local county jail to serve the remainder of my three-year sentence. I had learned over time that when sharing a cell with another man, it was important to be respectful and friendly, but to remember that no one was truly your friend. My new cellie was a quiet, heavy-set guy in his 40s. When I was moved in, he pointed to the bottom bunk and I put my stuff down. I introduced myself and he just sort of grunted and nodded his head. He appeared to be a quiet guy. That was fine with me. Being a reader, I hated sharing a cell with a guy that talked constantly. He didn't offer his name and I wasn't going to push. If he wanted to know me, he'd tell me. The first few days were quiet. We did our own things. Chow and wreck, usual prison stuff. On my third afternoon in, we were locked down after some gang members stabbed another. Expecting the usual silent treatment from my cellmate, I rolled onto my bunk and cracked open a book. Minding my own business and focusing on my book, I hadn't paid attention to what he was doing. I was shocked out of my own world by a low, gravelly voice above me. It was my celly. He began by asking me what I was in for. The shock of hearing him talk after all this time made me forget momentarily. Oh, oh yes, yeah, sorry, uh, manufacturing, meth and stuff. The usual for me. I knew he wanted to see my papers to verify, so I passed them up before he asked. Good to hear. If you were a pedo, I'd have killed you. This wasn't a surprise to me. The usual attitude toward any guy that came in with any sort of child charges was kill on sight. Man, if I was some kid diddler, I'd deserve to die. He let out a low grunt in agreement, and I expected that to be all he had to say to me for God knows how long. But he was far from through. I've killed multiple men in my life, but I like killing pedos the most. I was surprised a little by this. A dude at Chow told me my first day there that my cellmate was inside for making meth too. So his talk about killing and talking so freely at that surprised me. Guys usually avoid talking about that stuff. There was a snitch around every corner. Maybe he was testing me or thought I'd be too scared to tell. Regardless of the reason, he didn't hesitate. Being too curious to speak, I just listened as he told me the whole thing. Back in 72, I was hitching across Texas. 
Uh, my dad had moved in with his girlfriend in New Mexico. Since my mama had kicked me out once I got expelled from school, my daddy's was the only place I had to go. Now, I ran into a dirty old beater every now and then, but not like the last one to pick me up. A long-haul trucker had just taken me as far as the New Mexico side of the state line, and I was hoping to get to my daddy soon because I was running out of money. After not seeing anybody for a couple of miles, I managed to get picked up by this old man in a Ford truck. He seemed like a regular type of old man, not the kind he turned out to be. We had driven about ten miles and he turned to me and mentioned that he could take me the rest of the way to Santa Fe. Being tired of walking, I was one happy fellow to hear that. But then he told me that I'd have to help him out, if you know what I mean. I was only sixteen at the time, so I was somewhat confused as to his meaning. That was until he began unzipping his jeans. Then I caught on real quick. I had no intent on doing anything like that and I told him so. The look on his face made me angry like he didn't believe me. I noticed he was pulling the truck to the side of the road and I thought he was going to let me out. Instead, when we stopped, he turned to me and insisted I could ride all the way to my daddy's if I just did this one thing. This time, the tone of his voice was more desperate. Well, of course, I was furious by now and I told him he could burn. When I turned to open the door to get out, he grabbed me and tried to force my head down. There was no way I was going to let some man treat me like this. So while I fought him off, I stabbed him with my buck knife till he quit fighting. Once I was sure no one had seen me stick him, I got out and pushed him over the passenger side I'd been on. I took his place behind the wheel and drove about a mile up the gravel road until I saw a big cliff I could push him off of. I took some work seeing as uh, the old man had a good fifty or so pounds on me, but I managed to get him over the cliff. His body fell around fifty feet and I seen his head smash against some rocks. If that stabbing didn't get him going, over that cliff sure did. I washed myself off in the little creek further down the hill. Considered taking the truck the rest of the way to Santa Fe, but I knew the law would be looking for it if someone reported him missing. Seemed a shame to be leaving that nice little truck out there to rust, but I sure didn't want to get caught driving it. The walk back to the highway took a few hours. I managed to make it to my daddy's about a week later, and that's why I stayed until I got locked up on a gun charge. I'm still not sure to this day if that story was true. Regardless if it was or not, I made sure to watch my cellmate for the remaining time we bunked together. When a man does something so cold, you can't turn your back on him. Some small slight could be blown out of proportion and you could end up dead. A lot of years have passed since I heard that story. My Sally and I never discussed it and I have never repeated it until today. As I said before, I'm not sure if it ever really happened, but as you get older, maybe nots mean a lot less. Thinking that some family out there never saw their family member because of a murderous psychopath matters a lot more. In my younger years, before the divorce of my parents, we often spent our summer holidays taking road trips to various tourist spots across America. We of course hit all the usual places, the Disneys, the Grand Canyon, and even Hawaii once. The Hawaii one wouldn't qualify as being a road trip, but it only seemed right to include it anyway. Spending so much time on the highways and back roads means you're more than likely to have at least one memorable experience, if not more, but today, I will share one in particular so extreme it would prove to be the undoing of our happy family. This specific summer I have in mind, my dad wanted to change the regular routine up and do something a little different. At first, he wouldn't let on to what he had in mind, but once each of us had our own theory, he filled us in on the complete plan. He booked us into a dude ranch in Wyoming. Not yet a teenager, I loved the idea and my younger brother felt the same. However, when it came to my mom, she was much less enthusiastic, at least at first. 
She had no idea how to ride a horse or how to do anything related to it, considering she'd grown up in Chicago. But the moment my dad reminded her that none of us did either and flashed her his charming smile, any misgivings she had disappeared. Dad always knew how to bring my mom over to his way of thinking. She told us once that, Your dad is so charming he could sell ice to an Eskimo twice. I guess this meant that she was unable to hold her own ground against a man she found so handsome. This is why their separation just a few years later surprised me so much. We rejoined the story on the road to Wyoming. That morning, we had left Phoenix bright and early and Dad said we would make it to the ranch somewhere around dinner time the next day. The drive itself was normal until we got a flat tire someplace in the middle of Utah or Colorado. I don't remember which state we were in at the time. My brother and I had been in and out of sleep most of the ride, and when you're ten, every state looks the same, or at least it did for me. I do remember specifically that the time was about an hour before sunset. I had just learned in Cub Scouts how to estimate time using the sun and your hands, and I estimated it to be about a whole hand's width. So the moment Dad realized he had the flat, he pulled over onto the rocky shoulder and started to unload the jack and four-way he had in the back. We were on one of those old two-lane highways in the middle of nowhere and he had plenty of room to get out of the way of other cars. I guess the noise of the flat had roused my brother from his slumber and he was soon becoming his usual annoying self. In an attempt to give me and herself some relief, my mom suggested that he go outside and help my dad change the tire. This suggestion excited him, of course. Being a seven-year-old, he loved doing that kind of stuff, even though he wasn't really any help at all. Since I had been spared the trouble of my little brother, I was soon falling asleep again. The last thing I remember was the image of him kicking something at the barbed wire fence about ten feet away from the car. When I awoke again, I was laying face down on the floorboard of the back seat, and my chest and face was hurting a lot. Everything was ringing at first but soon I began hearing my mom moaning. After I lifted myself from the floor, I saw that she was injured for some reason. There was bloody cuts all over her face and the windshield was busted into a big spiderweb shape. When she noticed me, she reached over the back seat and asked me if I was okay. My chest was still hurting, but as far as I knew, I was fine. I still wasn't sure what had happened at this point. That was until my mom told me to get out of the car and check on my dad. I agreed, but I didn't know why I would need to. When I opened the heavy door, I looked back and saw my dad sprawled out on the gravel-covered shoulder. Other than a little dirt on his clothes and a bloody nose, he looked like he was sleeping, but he wasn't. I jumped out and went over to him. This was when I started to realize what had happened. The back of the station wagon was smashed in and moved a good ten yards. Not far away was a black Camaro smashed into one of the big fence poles holding the barbed wire, but the door was open and no one was inside. This is when I started taking things a little more serious. I kept shaking my dad, but he wouldn't respond. My greatest fear was beginning to look like a reality. Soon, however, a couple of men ran up to me and said that the ambulance was on its way and that they'd help my dad. If I wasn't already overwhelmed, I heard my mom's screams behind me. Turning to look, I saw her holding my brother in her arms, wailing. I didn't know then, but he was dead, and no matter what the doctors did, they couldn't change this. The remainder of that day was a blur. The only things I can really recall was the ride to the hospital and my mom sitting with me as we waited to get the news about my brother and dad. Later that evening, they notified us that my brother had passed. This news hit me harder than I think. My mom had known the second she saw him that he was gone, but I couldn't stop the crushing feelings of guilt that I had for all those times I'd hit and yelled at him. My dad did end up pulling through. He'd had a punctured lung and swelling on his brain, but after a couple of emergency surgeries, he was eventually able to make it back to 100% health again. However, when it came to his emotional health, I think the loss of my brother changed him, and a lot of that came from guilt. It wasn't until much later that I found out that he told my brother to go play because he didn't need any help. I didn't believe that he was being malicious towards him in any way, but regardless of this, 
he blamed himself for my brother's death for the rest of his life. My personal belief is that my mom knew what he had done, and she blamed him too, or maybe she blamed herself for sending him outside. This was never said out loud as far as I know, but it had to be something like this that would cause her to divorce him and leave me to live with him. It seemed after the wreck that every time she looked at me, it made her sad. Maybe I looked too much like my dad and I reminded her of his unforgivable sin. I have no clue. This all happened back in 1982, after all. Since they've both passed now, I guess all my theories and questions can never be addressed. Maybe that's for the best, anyway. Like they say, a wound can never heal if you keep poking at it. I'm not sure if that's really true. I'm probably not the right guy to ask about those things, but from my experience... Talking about something painful can sometimes make you feel better. After all, that's what I've been doing here, haven't I? I had some free time today and thought I would share a story about a scary incident I experienced while on the road with my brother's band about 20 years ago. Even though my brother and I shared the same parents, I inherited none of their prowess when it came to music. We both started lessons on the piano and guitar around the same age, and my brother showed from the beginning that playing music came to him naturally. When it came to me, no matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't get the hang of it. I continued with guitar all the way into high school, but realized soon after that I was never going to get any better. About the same time, my brother, who was two years older than me, got together with one of our friends and some guys from the next town over and formed a band. It wasn't long before they became one of the most popular rock bands in northern Florida and the time seemed right to take the show on the road. The initial group of shows stuck to the southern part of the country, Alabama, Georgia, etc., all of the old Confederate states. Since their style was often compared to Skinnerd and the Almonds, who were honestly two of their biggest influences, this plan seemed to be the most logical and financially sound. The mini-tour of the South lasted for about six months until the decision to try booking a few gigs out west was made. Considering I was now the road manager, the task of booking these dates fell upon my shoulders. Still unsure of the reception we'd receive out there, I only booked a small handful of shows. If I remember correctly, it was no more than six. Surprisingly, the shows went far better than we could have ever hoped, and at least for the first five, everything went off without a hitch. That would all end at our last show in California. I'm not going to name the town or venue specifically because I don't want to get them a bad name, and I still have to do business with these people. What happened wasn't their fault. At least, not that I think or can prove. If I have picked up anything from managing bands for the last 22 years, it's that you don't want to burn bridges with the clubs. They are the lifeblood of the touring band. It'd be stupid to anger one of them over something like that. I suppose I should tell you what that actually was and how it came to be. We pulled into the town that afternoon, but since we didn't play until that night, we did a little sightseeing and other touristy things to kill time. That evening, we arrived at the club around 8 and loaded in our gear. Being the opening band, we didn't get much of a sound check. Not much more than time to tune before they opened the doors. It being a weekday, there wasn't much hope that we would have much of an audience, but to everyone's surprise, including the club manager, the show sold out. Usually the opening band is who they are there to see, but we ended up with a really good crowd. You gotta love the internet. I can't imagine how hard it was for the little bands back in the dark ages to get a national audience without it. The guys started just after 10 and they stole the show. After our set, we were all on cloud 9 because of how well the tour had gone. We hung around and watched the headlining band play. Although I still think we stole the show that night, they were pure professionals and gave us a picture of what a well-fitting and hard-working band could achieve. Once the show had ended and the crowd was starting to trickle out, I picked up our pay out from the manager and headed straight for the van to stash it. I had found a place the first day we set out to hide it and that was where I was headed when I ran into my worst nightmare. 
The area that we had parked was directly behind the club and despite this, it was dark and quiet. I guess that's why I'd chosen it in the first place, but it proven to be an expensive mistake. As I approached the passenger side door of the van, I felt something, probably a gun, stick in my back and a deep calm voice tell me not to move or turn around. The second I heard him, I knew why he was there and what he wanted. I did my best not to move at all, but I was shaking so bad I thought he'd get mad, but he managed to stay calm the whole time. It seemed like an eternity before he spoke again. He told me not to turn around, just pass the money over my shoulder to him. This was the moment when I got the idea that there was more than one thief, even though I never heard or saw another person except people in the distance walking around the front of the club. Doing what he told me to do, I pushed the envelope over my right shoulder and felt it being pulled from my hand. For a brief moment, I didn't want to let go, but logic won out over greed and I did what I was told. At that moment, I could swear I heard him say, Yes under his breath as if he was answering someone, but like I said I never heard anyone else with us. Once I assumed he was pleased with his booty, he instructed me to stay where I was and count slowly to 200 before I moved. He made it clear that if I tried to turn around before then, he would shoot me, so I did what I was told and even added another 100 just to be safe. When I finally got up the courage to move, he was long gone. I was furious. I felt like a wimp and thought of losing all that money made me steam. With my head down, I walked back into the club and told the guys what had just happened. They were so cool that their only concern was that I was okay, but other than just being robbed at gunpoint, I was great. We headed to the front office and let the club manager in on the robbery. At first, I think he thought I was pulling his leg, but apparently my white paler was an indication of my honesty. He called the police and when they arrived I told them what had occurred at the van. Of course I couldn't give them any description of what he looked like but I did tell them that I thought that there was another person with him. I still wish I could have given them more but I had nothing to offer the investigation. They told us not to hold any hope that we'd get our money back and gave us their cards before they left. The only positive to that night was that we still had the money from our merch sales and what was left from the prior dates. At least he didn't know where I'd hidden the rest, or maybe he didn't care. Once we made it back home from the tour, we decided we'd do certain things different in the future. Unfortunately, there didn't end up being a future for the band. A giant mess of reasons why it all fell apart can be blamed, but it doesn't lessen the sadness of losing such a promising band. Then again, that's the story of rock music. Many more great bands have and will be destroyed for the silliest of reasons. To this day, I still have no idea how that guy knew I'd just been paid. The chance of the club setting me up was considered, but no decent club wants to get the reputation of being thieves. The best and most probable theory is that he'd just been watching me the whole evening and waited for his chance to pounce, and I gave it to him. It's been almost 20 years since that night, and I do business much different than I did then. There are chances I took then that I wouldn't dream of taking now, and I do everything I can to be aware of my surroundings despite the fact that I have others around me now to help me. If there is anything I could recommend taking away from this experience, I guess it would be to be vigilant and aware of what others are doing around you. If you meet eyes with another person and they get nervous or look away, they're probably up to no good. No matter what your job or class, you can become a target for criminals. Please just pay attention to others and be careful. My name is Mike and I'm here to share a story involving a very dangerous and scary situation I went through just the other night on my way to my girl's house. I'm not doing this to cause fear in other members of the sub. I only want to make you all aware of the dangers of driving alone at night, especially when no one else is around. Like I said at the time I had this encounter, I was on the road to my girlfriend's place about 20 miles from mine. Most of the area I had to drive through is heavily developed, however there's a stretch of roughly 5 miles that is probably just as rough as it was when people settled in the area just after the Civil War. It doesn't really matter how long it's been this way, 
I'm only attempting to convey the idea that it's completely undeveloped to you. I sometimes get too wrapped up in the history of the area and ramble on about it. I'm sorry about that and I promise I'll do my best to be brief as possible when giving you the facts of what led up to this occurrence. Regardless of the history of that road, there are no business or houses along that stretch of road, mainly just open fields and woods. Not to mention, at the time of night when I usually am going back and forth on the highway, there are little, if any, cars on that particular stretch. It's usually a quiet and enjoyable part to drive on and the entire time I've traveled on it, which has to have been hundreds, I never imagined that anything scary or violent could happen to me. Man, was I wrong. That night I'd clocked out just after midnight and sent my girl a quick text to let her know I was on my way. The plan was to spend the night at her place, so after a stop to get gas, I hit the road. That late in the evening I didn't see many cars going my direction, so I floored it in hopes to get to her house fast. However, just in a matter of minutes I came up behind two cars driving next to each other at a slow speed. I'm not sure what they were doing and I didn't care. I just wanted one of them to get out of my way so I could continue on my journey. In my haste, I honked at the car ahead of me in the passing lane. I'm not an idiot, I didn't lean on it. I just gave them a sort of beep to announce my presence. To my relief, the car sped up and moved over in front of the other car to allow me to pass. I was thankful to them for doing this, so I gave them a little kind wave. You know, the kind you give to a passing neighbor. Eager to get to my destination, I floored the gas again, but before I could even get 20 feet down the road, the car behind me turned on his brights and blinded me. This made me mad, but I flipped up my rear view mirror and tried to ignore it. If being blinded wasn't bad enough, the driver crossed the line to dangerous. Out of nowhere, I was rammed in the rear and almost lost control of my car. I realized then that I was in big trouble. There didn't seem to be any way to get out of this other than to outrun them, so I put the pedal all the way to the floor and prayed I could get away. Before I could gain enough speed, I was rammed again, this time much harder. My head was thrusted forward and back by the collision. The pain came almost immediately. Thankfully, I was able to pull away and leave the other car behind, but I could still see them about 60 yards in the distance trying to catch me. This was the moment I was saved. Most people wouldn't look forward to being caught speeding, but in the circumstances, I was relieved. i just lost sight of the car in my mirror when everything was lit up with blue and red colors. Overjoyed, I quickly pulled my car over and got out to greet the cop. He was a little nervous when I jumped out of the car, but soon enough I was able to get him to understand what I was doing. When he shined his flashlight on the back of my car, we would see the damage and it was bad. Of course, both of my taillights were busted and the rear clip was crumpled up like an accordion. I told them what had just happened and he had me follow him up the road to file a more in-depth report. He told me he'd do his best but the odds that they'd find the driver were low and that's what I figured when I made the report. I was just relieved to be alive and out of danger. My neck was still hurting so my next stop was the emergency room. I called my girl from the waiting room and she almost had a heart attack when I told her what had happened. She soon met me there and she made me let her follow me on the drive to her house. Like I expected, I had whiplash. All they could do was give me some prescriptions and tell me to come back if the pain got worse. Despite the sore neck, by the time I finally made it back to her house, I fell asleep instantly. Since then, I've had my girlfriend stay over at my place and, as far as I know, the cops haven't caught the driver. Like I said, I'm not telling you guys this story to scare you. I'm sharing it to remind you to be careful on the road at night and always be mindful of the way you treat other drivers. Just because you don't intend to make them angry doesn't mean they won't get mad. I used to be really into street racing and often participated in the local scene. On the weekends, we'd meet up in the parking lot of an abandoned or closed store, then, around 10 or 11, all drive out to a secret location to race. Sometimes we would go to a nice straight piece of highway or an old deserted airport in the country. We would usually not know our final destination for the night until we were all on the highway out of town. 
Generally, we would get our instructions over the portable radios that we all kept in our cars. There were a few of the older guys that had become the de facto leaders of our group, and they were the ones that got together to decide where we'd race that night. The plan was to not gather in the same place too often. We hoped this would keep the police on their toes and out of our hair. If I remember right, this happened on a Saturday night sometime on the summer vacation. It was a hoppin' night and everyone was enjoying the break from school. A friend of mine had just done some major mods to his S4 and was stoked to put it to the test. We'd chosen a race on a quiet place of highway at the edge of the county line. When my friend's turn came up, he was running against one of the older dude's Civics that was known to be one of the fastest cars in our part of the state. They were racing for a couple of hundred dollars. I'm not sure the exact amount, but it was mainly for bragging rights and my friend thought his chances were good. They lined up about a fourth of a mile from the bridge that crossed over the highway that we all watched from. Off the line, the older dude's Civic was faster and had a good two-car length lead, but slowly, my friend's Audi started catching up and soon they were side by side on the road staring each other down. At that point, we're not sure what happened, but my friend's Audi seemed to have swerved towards the Civic once, but he was able to get control. Unfortunately, he must have lost control again, as he was unable to pull out of it and slammed into the side of the Civic. The Civic then was slammed into the left-hand side concrete wall, but to our surprise, my friend's Audi swerved back all the way across both lanes and slammed into the right-hand wall. Both cars slowly rolled to a stop and everything fell silent. It seemed an eternity before somebody got the courage to run down to the cars and check on the drivers. At the speed they had been going, which was surely well over a hundred miles per hour, no one had much hope for their survival. I knew everyone would be on me if I didn't go check my friends, so I took a big deep breath and let it out and headed for his car. The walk to his car must have been the longest I've ever taken. In the distance, to my amazement, the dude in the Civic was moving and yelling something. I could see before I even made it to my friend's car that he wasn't moving. The front of it was crushed all the way to the driver's compartment and beyond. Upon approach, I couldn't even see his body at all, but once I got within a foot of the car, the true horror of the situation hit me like a sledgehammer. His body was laying slumped over sideways in the seat with the seatbelt holding it in a somewhat upright position. The really awful part was that his head was gone. At first, I thought it was being blocked by his body, but sadly, I was wrong. When I was at touching distance from him, I could see that it had been completely severed. How, I'm still not sure, but after a more intense search, the paramedics discovered it wedged in the passenger side floorboard. As soon as the reality of the horrid sight really hit me, I found myself overwhelmed. Lightheadedness came over me and I had to sit down on the cement wall to regain my composure. As I sat there, I watched as the driver of the Civic continued to yell about what I finally could tell was the pain in his leg. The crash had apparently caused the car to pin his leg between the dash and floorboard. Some of the others on the bridge continued to call me and ask about my friend, but I couldn't bring myself to answer. They'd find out on their own eventually. The ambulances and police showed up soon after I sat down and began working on getting the guy in the Civic out. The second they all saw my friend's condition, they moved on to the Civic. At first, everybody tried to lie to the cops about what had happened, but I saw no point. So when they spoke to me, I told them exactly what I saw. The firemen did manage to get the guy in the Civic out, but he ended up losing his leg anyway. I couldn't bear to look when they removed my boy from the car. Thankfully, most of the other racers were already gone when this happened. The cops cut me loose soon after, and when I got home, I told my parents about what had happened. They'd been worried about my participation in the scene for quite a while, and they were very happy to hear when I told them I was never going to race again. Seeing my friend die in such a horrible way made it all look so silly. I couldn't see the point of spending so much money on something so dangerous and soon after I sold my Supra to another guy I knew and put the money in my college stash. From time to time, I see a friend from the old days, and they tell me about the death of another racer. 
Meanwhile, I'll be graduating this fall with a degree. Most of those dudes haven't even gone to college and probably never will. I'm not saying I'm better because I have, but I certainly feel safer with the choices I've made. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.